Um, I'm Nate Warfield. Um, thank you for having me. This is actually my third time speaking at BrewCon. Um, Tom, you guys just killed it with the venue. I hope you eventually can figure out what the background on my slides is because I did it just for you. So, um, a quick, we're going to go through the agenda real quick here, and I'm going to let you know what I'm talking about. So, obviously, I'm going to be talking about uh, post-exploitation things against uh, F5 devices. So, I'm going to go a little bit into my background, who I am, what motivated me to put this talk together. Um, we're going to do a brief abbreviated history of the exploitation of F5 devices. Um, another article, uh, we'll get into the who UNC 3524 is on those slides. Um, then I'm going to go into some of the, basically the, the thought process and the way that I did this research to build this talk. And then we're going to get into the fun stuff. I've got three demo videos scattered throughout this talk. Um, we're going to see how I attack these things, implant these things. Like, I, I hope you like this. I feel like uh, you're in for a good time. Um, and then there's an actual like, very interesting hacking demo at the end that shows me doing some stuff that I'm going to wait until you see it. So, like I said, my name's Nate. Um, I'm actually one of the founders of a group that was called CTI League. This was a group of InfoSec volunteers that we put together in 2020. Um, essentially, I, we put out a call, and myself, uh, Mark Rogers, Ohohad from uh, India, we basically realized that hospitals were getting ransomware, and we wanted to do whatever we could to help. So in about a month, we built a 1,500-person volunteer group in Slack, um, giving away threat intelligence and perimeter assessments and anything we could to try to help hospitals keep from getting ransomware. Um, we ended up getting write, written up in Wired Magazine for this. We worked with pretty much every law enforcement agency on the planet. Um, and even now, two years later, I run into people that are like, you guys did so much good. Obviously, we never, won't really know what we stopped because it's hard to measure things that don't happen. Um, but it's something we did that was really good for the world. Um, I've been a network hacker since uh, my teens. Um, it's how I got kicked out of high school. Um, I do security research. Uh, it used to be in my spare time, like my couple of Rucon talks I did before was sort of spare time research. Now I'm a director of research at a firmware company called Eclipsium, so I get to do this like as much as I want, which is amazing. I also worked for F5 for 10 years, and I'm pretty sure when they see this, they're not going to be too thrilled at what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> and I worked at Microsoft. I spent seven years there. I spent four and a half years shipping out Patch Tuesday stuff, so I always like to say, you're welcome. Um, I also have the dubious honor of shipping the MS-1710, also known as the WannaCry patch. And I want to point out that I am not a red teamer. Um, I've mostly done defensive things. This is me just figuring out how to do this on my own. Um, and the point is, if I can do this, it's kind of scary what other people can do. And um, my Twitter handle is on there. I also use my full name everywhere. I don't really try to hide. So look me up, follow me, friend me on LinkedIn. I'm cool. So motivation. Um, like I said, I started CTI League. And the one thing that started it was literally load balancer vulnerabilities. Um, I was at Microsoft at the time playing with my Super God Showdown license. And I dumped all of these net scalers that were vulnerable and started looking for like keywords like hospital, healthcare, you know, in the organizational data. And I find two Citrix devices that were VPN devices that were on the network of my hospital that I go to for my general practice doctor. I've, they put my shoulder together after a snowboarding accident. I'm just like, oh my God, like these are VPN things attached to a hospital that are vulnerable to this nasty O-Day. Um, and I didn't know how to get a hold of people. So, you know, that process of figuring out who we could talk to, figuring out how to tell hospitals about this, it turns out, um, it's a lot harder to give away free, three, free threat intel than you would think it was. Um, we had people that actually straight up thought we were trying to blackmail them. Like people were emailing hospitals like, hey, you've got like RDP open to the internet or hey, you've got a, a Citrix device. And the response is like, you're blackmailing us. We're going to get the lawyers involved. And we're like, no, we're trying to help you. Um, so we ended up getting a lot of uh, interesting experience working with government partnerships. Um, we actually had somebody from the CISA, or the Cyber something intelligence, something agency in the United States. Um, they told us sort of privately until now that what we did in a month was something they've been trying and failing to do for 10 years. So we really sort of proved conceptually that private and public sector could work together for good. Um, and I also, in the process of this, I did a lot of sort of deep fear stuff for F5s. Uh, in 2020, in the summer, this nasty zero, well, not a zero day, but this, this really nasty bug came out that they fixed that was promptly exploited en masse um, over the US 4th of July holiday. So you know, we worked the weekend trying to help the CTI League hospital people we knew. I came in on Monday and found out that like 140 of the F5s that Microsoft ran had been hit by it too. So then Microsoft's like, hey, can you do DFIR on it? Because you're apparently the only guy that understands these in the company. So I've done a lot of the defensive side. And I figured 
Now it's time to do something offensive. And the point of this talk really is, if you're a pen tester, this is what you can do. Um, this is tricks to not get caught. This is how you, I was talking to someone the other night that it was like, hey, I go into these environments and I'm not allowed to touch the load balancers. And even if I could, I wouldn't because I don't want to take this thing down. So this will give you some clues on how to do it. And yes, there are some stuff that's defensive that'll help you if you're doing do you feel like this is what to look for so that when the APTs eventually, I can't wait for this talk to be used in a Mandiant report of like, hey, these a-holes use the information from this a-hole to breach this company. Like, it'll be a check mark on my resume. Um, yeah, and I mentioned Mandiant um, because as I was putting this together, I was going to go to NorthSec in Montreal and I was going to use the 2020 exploit, which is kind of horrible, it's bad, but it's really ugly to work with. And then um, the gods looked down on me, and uh, like Monday, one of the weeks in May, Mandiant releases this report about this UNC 3524 threat actor that I'm going to get into. And I was like, wow, this is cool, my work is relevant. I didn't think anybody was going to care about load balancers except me. And then two days later, another really nasty but very beautiful uh, zero-day-ish you know, remote code execution of volunteer ops from F5. And I'm just like, first there's the report, and now I have much better POC to work with. Like, yeah, it's been my year. Um, and the other thing, too, is that this is a space that people don't seem to understand very well, right? F5 devices, Citrix, load balancers, WAFs, firewalls, all these things are these, like, black boxes. You stick them in your network, you get it running, and then you just pray that it keeps working, that nobody touches it, and you kind of assume, I spent $150,000 on this piece of gear, the vendor must have made this stuff secure, which it's obviously, that's how it works, right? So, a brief history of F5 exploits. Like I said, I worked there for 10 years, and the first really bad vuln that we had reported to us was a, they left an SSH public-private key pair in an ISO image that you could download from their FTP server. The code that was supposed to roll the key when you first booted it up didn't work. So somebody figured out, if I download this ISO, pull out the private key, I can there, the public key, I can then SSH into any F5 in the world as root if they have the SSH port open. Um, Suboptimal. Uh, <laughs> this is the one from 2020. Um, this, I have a bit of a, I have a bit of a uh, pet peeve about people that don't pay attention to research, but this is yet another of the path traversal vulns. Same exact thing that happened with the Citrix vuln from 2019. I think Fortigate I'm also had one. Um, this, this, this exact POC, this dot, dot, semicolon, forward slash, was in a talk by this guy, Orange Sai. He spoke at Black Hat, and I think it was 2018, talking about this problem. And then nobody paid attention, and then, you know, two years later, machines are getting popped left and right. And it's like, guys, he told you right there how to look for this stuff. So, um, and this is the one that from 2022. And what this screenshot is, is actually just using the POC to dump and say, hey, let me look at the platform information of this device. Like that looks exactly like what you're, it looks like on an F5 shell. Like this is against the JSON endpoint, so everything comes back in JSON, and it's beautiful. I actually contemplated writing a wrapper around the exploit to use to basically emulate their entire shell so that you wouldn't have to log in. You could just use the exploit to run all your admin stuff. Um, and all of these things attack management interfaces. Like there aren't vulnerabilities in so much the traffic plane side of the F5, but the problem is, is that people point this stuff at the internet all the time. And I like exploits that fit in tweets. I have this thing, if you could put it in a tweet, it's amazing. So both of these last two years of exploits for FIs both fit inside a tweet with room to spare. So this is the report that got me interested in it, right? So I was sitting there wondering if anybody was going to care about a load balancing talk. And Mandiant releases this report, and you can read along these little blurbs that I pulled out that were interesting. but. The gist of it is, is this you know, alleged Russian cyber actor, cyber espionage group, um, was hacking into networks and they were getting in through SAN arrays and uh, load balancers. And while they didn't actually specify which load balancers, they mentioned in their thing, they're like, yeah, these devices run CentOS or BSD and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, the only load balancer in the world that uses CentOS as its management interface is F5. So I was like, okay. Um, and the other stuff that I thought was, Interesting is as I'm reading this article, right? They're talking about like what did they use as their their back door? Well, they modified the drop bear SSH client and they just plopped that on the machine and then they would SSH in. I'm like, APT? Really? You're, you're like nothing custom, nothing cool. Um, the other stuff that was interesting too is they have they even say that this had no method of persistence. Like there was, you know, they tried to modify some RC scripts. They tried to modify some stuff that would let them come back in. But it was also unreliable to the point where they had to drop a web shell on servers in the environment because they would use the web shell to turn their implant back on when it turned off. So I'm just like, man, you guys really don't know what you're doing. Um, so, you know, I was like, very elite, much hack, hold my beard. I bet you I could do better. 
Um, and my point was, right, these guys don't have persistence. They're, they, it's there, but if you reboot the box, it's probably going to go away. Um, that was even something we told people in Deep. We're like, well, reboot it first. Um, after you try to image it, reboot it, and then wipe it. Um, but I'm like, their malware is not going to survive an upgrade. It's not going to survive patching. I'll bet you I can do better than that. Um, I thought it was weird that for a, you know, a Russian threat actor, they're using open source software with like a hard-coded password that is easily, I mean, the Mandiant Report has Yara rules. It's like, this is how you find it because the password is hard-coded into the binary. I'm like, that's not very, intel like, very op uh, good OPSEC. Um, as I mentioned, it was unreliable, and I kind of thought that they were strangely inept for like this cyber actor. Now, this isn't a slight Mandiant. Um, it just seemed very strange that you know, they were able to stay in the environments for like 18 months undetected, which I was like, that's pretty impressive. Um, they're also on an endpoint thing that's hard to monitor, right? Like I said, these are black boxes. You just kind of leave it alone until something goes wrong with it. So I decided to do some reconnaissance and figure out, knowing some of the stuff I already knew from working at F5, like what can I do? Like, could I do better than an APT? Could I make something more pervasive and more sort of deeply implanted on one of these things? So the quick CLDR, I kind of assume that everybody's a network engineer and everybody knows what a load balancer is, but basically they're big, super expensive pieces of networking hardware. Um, if you like, think of like a catalyst switch, I'm dating myself, I think Cisco uses Nexus or something else now, but the price point on these things, it starts at around $90,000 and then it goes up to three quarters of a million dollars a piece. And they sell them in pairs because if you need to do maintenance, you fail over to the other one so that you're never gonna have traffic interruption. These devices run in, I think it's 400 of the Fortune 500 companies, like every cell phone in the company in the world uses them. Most banks, US Space Command. I don't know if you know who Costco is, but they also use them. Walmart uses them, like they're everywhere and they've been around for 20 years. So they've got a huge market share. Um, they've kind of become this Swiss army knife of networking, which is part of how they got themselves in trouble. So they do everything from layer four to seven load balancing. You can make it a web application firewall. It does DNS load balancing. A lot of people used to buy them for their TLS offloading back when you know, computers and, and chips were expensive and you only wanted to buy one SSL certificate and let it do all the SSL on the load balancer and then use clear text HTTP to the back because that was smart to do back then. But the nice thing is these also are deployed in places where they usually have fairly unfettered access to your network, right? It, it's somewhere in the core of a network. It's somewhere where there's tons of valuable stuff happening and you want it to be able to talk to everything. Um, the other part of that minimum is because they're so big and expensive and because F5 is <coughs> questionable code quality, um, they, people leave these things outdated for a long time. Um, I, when I worked at Microsoft, I was on the networking team and we would spend about a year and a half to test and certify a new build of code Granted, we had 2,300 F5s that we had to upgrade, but it took a long time for us to certify a code and say, this is stable enough that we can put Passport and Hotmail and Outlook or Office365.com traffic on it. So, and a lot of people I talk to that manage them, they're like, yeah, dude, I don't upgrade it unless I have to. Like, I'm scared that it's gonna blow up and it's gonna cause an outage. Um, and because these things are proprietary, there is no EDR software that runs on it, right? It's CentOS Linux. The management operating system is CentOS. Somebody could, in theory, make uh, EDR software for it, but unless you were to partner with F5 and make it an accepted thing, you, when you upgrade these things, they just wipe the, they, you upgrade to a new boot location, it lays down a new copy of the operating system, whatever patch it is, and then you roll it over. So it's not as simple as like AV or EDR on Windows, and as Dave just mentioned, that's kind of a panacea anyways. So a little bit about how these things are deployed, and this is where we, they started getting themselves into trouble. All of these devices, of course, being networks, network devices, there's a switch, and there's always a port on the end that's a gigabit length that's out of band management with SSL and, or SSH and TLS. Um, they're deployed, like I said, in pairs, and similar to HSRP, there's a sort of a device-specific IP address. There's a, what they call a floating address, which is where your servers will point at their default gateway. The idea is when it fails over, not even the only thing that happens is the MAC address changes in the switch cam tables. The servers never see anything change. The switch table, the switches just say, oh, this MAC is now over here instead of over there. The idea is that you never interrupt traffic flow. Um, behind these things live big pools of servers. This is where all your resource stuff is. This is where all your clear text HTTP is happening, right? They, then you stick a virtual server on the front of it. This is where you add TLS, um, TLS encryption. 
um, and all the other fun things that you know you can do. Sometimes people run these almost like a hub and spoke mode where they've got different networks that are coming through that are routing internally and they're doing internet traffic through it because like I said, they're really expensive. So you try not to buy these things. It's like you try not to buy a bunch of them. You try to buy one and do everything with it. And then they've got this weird idea of profiles, which is just like, a, it's a Swiss Army knife of fine tuning every little detail about TCP IP, HTTP, TLS. But the fun thing is that they also have this TCLTK embedded interpreter that runs inside their load balancing traffic plane, which allows you to, in real time, look at data and manipulate it. And you can make load balancing decisions. You can inject data inside things. You can reroute traffic. And it all happens at like you know 40 gigabit speed or whatever their back planes are now. So how do you find these things, right? So the idea, you're on an engagement. There's a way you can do it. There's a few ways, right? You can look at Shodan. Um, and Shodan actually will not so much expose the devices themselves, but you can search for this big IP server cookie. Um, and it's just some sort of a weird, it's like modded, modulated something, encrypted. It's not encrypted, but if you can find the server hash off of Shodan, you can, you're basically exposing the back end IPs and ports that are behind this F5 device. So you can tell, OK, well, this IP address right here is something that there's an F5 in front of. Um, and there's a person that wrote a decoder that does this for you. Um, this is why the whole thing is right, that allows them to only speak HTTP on the back. Um, if you get on one of these things, all of the certs and keys are stored in clear text on the file system. Um, they don't by default ship with HSMs. There is no real secure way of storing it. Like it's a text file on a hard drive. You could just grab the entire, like if you're on an engagement trying to show what you can steal, just zip up the whole hard drive or as we'll get to you, use their embedded functionality to do it for you. Um, once you get on it, some of these commands are, like I said, it's red team centric. So this is some stuff. I'm not going to put the whole command manual in there because we would be here until next BrewCon. Um, but you can basically list and see what kind of authentication. These things speak every authentication protocol. You know, once you're on it, you know, I have, was trying to decrypt like the Active Directory password and figure out if I could do like a replay attack against an AD server once I'm on the F5. Again, not a red teamer. Somebody who is, you probably could figure this out. Um, but the other thing that when we're going to see this in the demo is because they're deployed in pairs, you can find out a lot of stuff about the environment around this device just by using embedded commands. It'll tell you about its peer devices. It'll tell you about every other F5 that it knows about. It's kind of like Cisco to discovery protocol. Like they sort of all, you know, they become self-aware. They know where everybody else is. And so you can start discovering a whole lot about internal addressing schemes. It'll tell you, you know, here's the peer device and here's all of the network interfaces that it has and all of the subnets that it's on. Right, so you get all sorts of mapping just by looking on one of these things. Um, as far as finding them on Shodan, um, there's a bunch of queries that I put together. I have a GitHub. I used to keep it updated. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not, there's not as many now. I think in 2020, there was like 15,000 with their management interfaces on the internet. Um, this year, when we saw this last exploit come out, I think it was down around like seven or eight. Um, so it's getting better, maybe. So quickly, like I said, you're on one of these things. They have a concept of a traffic plane and a control plane. Or I'm sorry, yeah, control plane and management plane. No, I'm probably screwing that up. Anyways, traffic management. One of them you touch, one of them you don't. Um, the TMN side is where their proprietary code is. It's basically, it takes over the entire device. It takes over all the networking interfaces, and then it gives back a certain percentage of resources to the CentOS side. Um, uh, the CentOS side. So. You can figure out your platform information, right? Some of these things are small. The one I think I showed you in my example was just running it on a VM. So it gives you an idea of like how big of a box am I on? Um, and then this other image is kind of the way their architecture works, right? They've got their hardware stuff, um, their full proxy thing down there. Like if you have somebody, even, even if these devices are doing sort of end-to-end -end encryption, right? Say so they've got an encryption to the internet, they decrypt it so they can use this eye roll stuff to manipulate their traffic, and then they re-encrypt it to the backend servers, like this is what banks do. Um, if you can packet capture on the internal, essentially the traffic interface, you can sniff encrypted traffic as it's going through the device, or unencrypted traffic as it's going through the device. Um, obviously, don't do this unless you really know what you're doing, because if you've ever been a network person and you've tried to like packet capture a 40 gigabit interface, you can't just do that wide open, um, but you can, and it's there. On the management side, it's a fully functional operating system. It's a fully, fully functional CentOS install. Um, downside, it, doesn't, it has Python 2, so all the cool hacker toys are written in Python 3, and most of those won't work. Um, it doesn't have pip, so you can't install anything. They took all the compilers out. But it's Red Hat or it's CentOS. If you were so inclined, you could pick, you know, it's not Debian, which is easy, but you could figure out all the RPMs you needed 
and then just install all of them, and you could probably get like Metasploit to run on this thing. Um, there's really no controls on it. They don't tell you you can't install software, and the hard drive is huge, so there's no like st size constraints of like, oh, you know, you only have enough to hold the operating system. Once you get on the device, everything you care about is in a directory called slash config, which we're going to talk a lot more about here in a minute. And the interesting thing about these, though, is they're designed with a GUI, right? And they spent way more time writing their GUI than they ever did writing their command line. Um, I don't know, 15 years ago when I was working for them, working with Microsoft, instead of working for Microsoft, Microsoft pretty much held them, like, held them hostage until they built a better shell. Like, there was no shell, there was no like, Cisco-style shell at the time. You basically could only use the GUI. And somebody wrote a document saying, have you tried to change the, the DNS servers on 1500 F5s? And he did the math. He was like, it takes this long to log into the GUI. I have to do this many clicks to do this thing. I have to do this click. He's like, and now I have to do this 1500 times. And it was like a week and a half or something was the time it took. So everything has been designed for GUI, and everything that I'm attacking is inside the command line and all on the, on the low-level file system. So if you don't know how to look, like you're never going to find this. Um, the other thing, if you're going to go start screwing around with these, um, they share their the stuff that like the load balancing configuration is shared, and they do have this sort of stateful intelligence between the two. So if you make a change to anything that's a load balancing configuration, the devices will pop a little alarm and say the configuration's out of sync. Um, so that's a be, be delicate if you're going to go, you know, what you'll see here in the demo at the end. Um, but the device configs themselves are completely transparent. Like, nothing, it never tells anybody that, hey, somebody opened up a new port on this device, or hey, somebody added a new route to this device. Like, you can do whatever you want, and as long as it doesn't touch the load balancing config, they're never going to know. There we go. So, now we get to the fun part. Because, like I said, they have been sort of the Swiss Army knife of networking, and F5 was happy to cram any features and functionality that a customer asked for into their device. So one of the things that got people bit, uh, Microsoft included, was that they mostly you think, OK, there's a management interface. As long as I keep my management interface and my management network, I'm safe. Yes and no. By default, all those, those three addresses that, it, that you have to use, you know, HSRP thing, the management interface gets turned on on all of those, too. And they don't tell you this. It's just by default that gets turned on. So what we saw was people saying, my management interface is off the internet. And we're like, well, yeah, but the interface that your virtual servers are on, like, did you just allow that subnet into the DMZ? Or they're like, yeah, well, then you have self-IPs. The gateway address is, if it's accessible, your management interface is enabled on that thing, too. And the people's eyes are like, oh, shit. Um, then they started doing things like sharing routing tables. Now, they're not the only ones that do this. Um, some other vendors do the same thing. But every other, like, I looked at Citrix, Juniper, Cisco, they have this ability to say, there's the traffic plane, and it has its own routing table, and then there's the management plane, and it has its own routing table, and never the two shall speak, right? With an F5, your management interface could have no gateway, but when I get on it, if there's a default gateway to send out to the internet, like, I can use my malware on the management operating system to use the traffic route to get out to the internet. Not the best thing, but it's by design. But my favorite is there's multiple ways that are in the code that lets you run scripts whenever you want. <laughs> Um, it has a, these are documented solutions on their website where they say this is how you can run a script when it boots up. Um, these are scripts that you could run when the devices go active or standby. Um, you can run scripts when a specific log message is entered by syslog. Like I've never seen any other piece of gear that lets you like run code just when any little event happens. And then the configs, like I said, are in this one directory and. Like a Cisco device, a Juniper device, most of these things, like if you want to save the configuration, you basically back up just a text file, right? F5, on the other hand, takes that directory. It basically makes a tarball of the entire thing, whatever is in that directory. It does not care if it's a system file or not. You could have accidentally like, been writing a letter in VI and left in there. It doesn't care. Whatever, if it's in that directory, it gets backed up. It gets put into this config backup, um, which is used for a bunch of things that we'll talk about. And it's also got this massively deep directory structure of snapshots. Like, I had to take this thing apart because I looked at their documentation, and I was like, oh, it tells you what files are backed up. And then I realized that it wasn't entirely accurate. And I just took an archive, put it in a temp directory, untarred it, and started digging through it. And I was like, my god, there's so much stuff in here. There's so many directories they don't even tell you about. So now I knew Kung Fu. And what you're watching here is the first of your demo videos, where this device is going to log a syslog message, and then it's going to call out to my C2. So that little script up there is the script that runs a command. 
This is the system log from the F5. And now I'm going to go stop my Apache web server. And we'll get into details of why this is taking so long in a second. But eventually, there we go. The session gets popped back, right? Log message, and all of a sudden I have C2 back to my command server. So hack all the things, get all the money. Um, let me do it on time. All right. So what I basically used to do this was I used the exploit from this year, um, and I used the Sliver C2 framework, and I used a script that I got from F5's knowledge base. Um, what I did was I took this script, and I decided I want sort of the one script to rule them all. I want this thing to obviously be able to start my malware. I want it to also be able to check for the existence of the malware on the system. If it doesn't exist, I want it to be able to download this malware. And, and, if it, uh, and I also want this thing to survive through an upgrade, a ripe, a reboot, you know, whatever it is. So what it does is it basically, when it runs, it sleeps. That's why you saw that delay. It does a random sleep because I don't want it to ever start two copies of itself. Um, I chose a server or a daemon name based on I looked through their run service list in PS, and I said, okay, there's all these run service, you know, these different daemons that are running. And then I found one called REST Java D. Now, REST Java D, the run service starts JRE, which is this whole humongous, hideous string, but there's no actual process named that. And I didn't know, you know, if I use one that's existing and I put it in a different directory, if somebody does a PID of, is it going to accidentally try to talk to the malware instead of the actual process and get me caught? So what I do is the script will, it starts up, it sleeps, it checks, is, is anything running? If it's not, do I have the malware on my system? If I don't, let me go bypass. They have a security thing where they mount the user system read only because they think nobody's going to be able to hack it. So I remount it read write. I download my malware, make it executable, and then I timestamp it by taking the timestamp of one of the system CTL binaries in the same directory, stomp the time thing, mount it read only again, and then start it. The idea is if you're like, what is, you look on a box, you say, okay, well, this looks like a right process. You look inside user bid, everything has the same timestamp. There's no new files in there. Um, and yeah, at that point, I'm in. So <laughs> then I'm also writing the starter. I'm writing this round, I call it a runner script. I write this to these failover configuration files so that when the device goes back or forth, it will always make sure, it'll always at least start. And maybe it starts up, it's like, nope, the implant's already running, I'm just gonna go back to sleep. Or, hey, it's a new box that they just installed. I need to go grab my malware and uh, put it on there. And like I said, this prevents you know, somebody logging in and being like, why are there 500 of this process running? Like, that seems weird. That seems suspicious. Um, and those persistence files get backed up, right? And instead of me, I'm using Sliver, which is cool because it's, it runs on a pretty much every OS. The downside is the implants are like 15 megs. So I was initially going to, I was going to put all this stuff in the config directory. But I was like, man, somebody would notice if they did a config backup. And instead of it being like, one and a half megs, all of a sudden it's like 17 megs. They'd be like, well, that's weird. That file's huge compared to all the other ones on our file server. So I just figured make a tiny little script that nobody's going to notice. Oh, I clicked back. So the other fun thing, because of these devices, and there's a funny story that I'm going to go through with you here. These devices don't allow servers behind them to talk to the internet by default. Um, they create, they, they restrict this like with the presence or the absence of like an outbound NAT, like think your home cable router. Um, and then you actually have to enable it and say, yes, this serve, this VLAN is allowed to talk to the internet, and as long as there's an egress IP on that network, then everything's hunky-dory. So this, this, uh, this F5, encased in a block of ice, is keeping everything very cold and very secure, right? Um, now, Sliver allows you to do pivoting. So for those who were like me and learning about this, it means I can set up a C2, and then I can pivot other systems through my C2 back out to the internet. Now, F5 lets you actually attach a seed like a listener IP to one of the system addresses. Like, it doesn't care. your root, and it doesn't have any way to differentiate. Like, is this something that I should do? Or did this weird process that actually doesn't have a shell wants to bind to a port? Like, YOLO, that seems fine to me. And you can change the ACLs on the interfaces to let your implants in without anybody noticing. Like I said, device-specific things, there's no logging, there's no alerting. So, you know, you don't even have to be sneaky. You know, real sneaky, right? So now that I've done this, I'm able to pivot my traffic, my delicious traffic is now pivoted out through my very cold firewall into my waiting C2 cup. And the story behind this is this is one of the, uh, these are one of the first of the chassis load balancers that F5 made. They were deployed in Xbox Live's network when Xbox Live first became online. They gave them so much of a headache that instead of like refurbing them or selling them on eBay, they took a $450,000 load balancer rewired all the LEDs, encased it in a block of ice, and turned it into a beer tap for their Christmas party. 
Like, I know that people don't like stuff, but that's like office space printer? Like, no, I love, you have no comparison to putting half a million dollar piece of gear just soaked in ice and beer. But it was a, it was a good party. So, what are we doing on time? All right, we're doing okay. So, the low level persistence. Um, okay, there we go. So this is, like I said, the backups, this backup directory that people use, um, it's used for, it has pretty much everything. The documentation, like I said, it tries to tell you what files are backed up. It turns out that some of the stuff they say isn't backed up is, some of the stuff they say is backed up isn't, and then there's just random places where they just grab an entire directory and I can't figure out why. So there can, I basically was, like I said, I had to unpack it and say, well, let me just look at what it does on a device. Um, so anything in there, there you know, you, there's no signatures, there's no hashing, there's no list of trusted, the list of trusted files doesn't actually work. And what you're seeing here is loading a dirty config file on a device, and I had to speed it up because these things are slow, but I load a dirty config and then click the implant start. So this is what would happen if you had wiped your machine, say, oh, take a config backup, wipe the machine, take a config backup, buy a new one, stick it on here, we want to make sure the malware is gone. Well, now, yes, this is predicated on the device being able to talk to the internet or wherever it gets its C2, but, you know, details, details. So here's the blue team stuff. This is about the only thing you blue teamers are going to get in this talk. These files are what I'm abusing. There's a file called config startup, which, as you might imagine, is what runs when you start up the device. There's a directory called failover with a bunch of files that you can write to that run scripts when things change state. And then the syslog message is in this user alert con. So if you're ever doing a uh, defear engagement or something weird happened, those are the files you want to check first, right? You can also check the RC files. You can check crontab. Um, and the script cuties will probably use those. I mean, the UNC groups. Um, but they don't get saved. So, you know, there's no point in writing to cron because they actually, oddly enough, don't back up cron in their config backup. So if you created a bunch of, you know, archive jobs and back up your config jobs in cron, like your SOL, because you have to recreate those when you put your new device in place, it's kind of backwards. Um, but the other thing is their upgrade process, right? So instead of, because it's not just a flat file, like I think I mentioned, when it upgrades it, it's, you basically say, hey, I want to patch this machine. You're obviously not going to patch a running machine. It takes the OS, it puts it into a boot location, it takes the you know, patch, it puts it in the patch there over the OS, and then it zips up the config directory, and it plops it on the other side. Now, because it's basically laying down a fresh copy of the operating system, my fancy little trick of hiding in user bin, well, it's not going to go there. But the fact is, you took the script that loads the malware with your config backup, and you plopped it into your new install, and then you booted it up. And so that process that you saw, or you're seeing right now, just happens as soon as you turn it on, right? Yeah, I made this as hard to get rid of as possible. Um, so now, it's demo time, the actual fun, longer format demo. And um, we're gonna, this has music. We're going to see if it works, and if it hopefully doesn't kill your eardrums. And I'm going to narrate this, because it's complex, and I need, you to, I need to explain what's going on. A little lower. All right, so what I'm doing here is basically just showing you. I'm going to turn that down just a tiny bit more. There we go. So what I'm doing here is just showing you this is my setup, right? In the top, you'll notice that these things are in sync. This is the logging. Um, what I'm doing is basically showing that I found a big IP. And this is what poor OPSEC will look like, right? So these are the system logs. OK, now it sees that somebody's running a command on the device, right? That's bad. Um, fortunately, this exploit allows me to turn off syslog. So being a good hacker, I turn off syslog. It even tells me, hey, we shut down syslog for you, which I think was beautiful. So now I can start discovering the peer device, right? So I know there's one. Where there's one, there's two. I can see there's another box, but I can't really see how to get to it. So I need to figure out how many devices are in this group. So I find out, okay, there's two. Obviously, the other one's named Big IP2. So I figure out you know, these are all commands to list it. And now I've got the addresses of the secondary device by talking to the first device. So of course, let's shut off syslog on the other one. We don't want to get caught. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to throw this very ugly command, which is the throw the exploit, load the, uh, load the implant, start the implant on one of them. This is an artifact of the way the, the exploit works. On the other one, I'm just going to basically tell it download the implant and write to my persistence files, but I don't start it. So now I'm going to see, okay, I've got a session on this device. I'm going to make it active. And now I'm going to set up my pivot listener on the F5 so I can hack into the Windows server later. Um, you know, it binds to the port, no problem. We add the uh, firewall things. Both of them, you notice, still say in sync. Nothing's happening, system normal. Everybody's fine here. How are you? So 
this side I'm going to use Metasploit. Um, and I go in, first I'm going I'm to do the same thing. I'm going to hack into one of the F5s. Um, the demo gods were not kind to me there, but I wasn't going to redo it, so I hacked into the other one, and this time I actually got a shell that was usable. So now I've got a shell on this F5. I can go and run the Metasploit port scan module to say, hey, is there any Windows servers behind this device, right? Um, but pretending I don't know where I'm at, right? Okay, port scan, lo and behold, there's a Windows server. Um, it doesn't have access to the internet, and I didn't have enough time to show you, but trust me, it didn't. Um, so now I'm like, well, it's a Windows server. I'll bet that vulnerability that I shipped a patch for didn't actually get installed because nobody did. Um, so we use the MS1710 exploit. We get a shell. In fairness, I cheated. I uploaded the implant beforehand because my VM lab is slow and you would have had to sit here for like seven minutes watching it upload. But now I start it, it's pivoted back through my F5. So I have my F5 device, and now I've got my Windows server that's talking through my F5 to my C2. So, you know, never one to, you know, to stop there. Um, I drop into the shell, and this is where I'm going to show you how the eye rolls abuse can happen, right? So you'll notice, as in a second, what I'm doing is I'm creating the rule. And this is a very simple rule, right? I don't, I don't, I'm not a JavaScript programmer. I didn't want to learn. So I'm just tweaking this thing. And as soon as I save this file, you'll notice that devices are going to say, change is pending, right? This is how you get yourself caught, right? You, if, somebody, if somebody was watching, they would notice, well, something just changed, right? But you can also have it send an SNMP trap when this happens, or better yet, log a message. Um, so I run the config sync command, and now they're both back in sync. So OK, nobody noticed that I created this rule, and I bound this rule to the web server that we just looked at. However, when our poor user tries to go back to goodguy.com, turns out they can't go to goodguy.com anymore, right? Now, and this could be something like, you could, if you're smart, smarter than me, you could put a keystroke log or you could put any sort of malicious stuff in someone's website. So, you know, you all of a sudden, your users complain, oh my god, my website's gone. So, you know, being a good sysadmin, you're like, well, shoot, we need to do, uh, we need to do, do defair. Let's fail over the device to the other one. Click, standby comes back up. Now I have both. Right, this was the idea, it was you can't get rid of me when I do it this way. So, yeah, that's the demo. <laughs> so, now, I'm not done, not yet, almost. So if you wanna do this yourself, uh, it turns out it's a lot easier to build an F5 hacking lab than you would think. Um, you just, they give away virtual edition VMs for every major hypervisor out there, including vulnerable versions. Um, if you want to go play around with these exploits that are on the internet, just figure out what versions are vulnerable and go get the VM that's vulnerable. Like, I've never heard of a software company giving, well, actually, I correct myself because I got a VM of Windows 2012 without the MS1710 patch, so I guess they're just aspiring to be like Microsoft. Um, but the best part about this is you can use a, I mean, those devices were licensed. That was a fully functional pair of F5s. Um, when you just download and install it, they won't work. However, Use a throwaway email account, like one of those website ones that you use for logging in, for like giving it to spammers. Use one of those, set up an account. That's how you get to their download system anyways. And then go and say, I want some trial licenses. And F5 will gladly give you three 30-day time-limited licenses for their virtual product. And you can do this as many times as you want. I think I've gone through about 30 or 40 of these things in like the last six months because I kept burning down my lab and building it up with different versions and fiddling with stuff. Um, like, and you can also get the ISO images too. So like the guy that found that SSH key thing, if you want to go and start digging around and finding out how woefully out of date some of the modules and the code that they have in there, grab an ISO, unpack it, dig around. Now they don't have a bounty program, so all you're really going to get is street cred for your CVEs. You're not going to actually get any money for it. Um, but maybe I'll talk about your exploit or your vulnerability in my next talk. And that is actually all I had. Um, if there's any questions, I think I've got Actually, I'm a little bit on time. I've got like four minutes for questions, it looks like. Oh, and by the way, here's the cheer. Tom, when I said, wait, I made this for you guys. That's, yeah. So I was on the roof the other night, and I was like, that's just a gorgeous view. So I had to go and customize it. But yeah, you're the first conference I've done that for. Speechless. OK. All right, well, if there's no questions, thank you for coming to see me. Thank you, BrewCon, for having me.